Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the March seminar of Sullivan Renaissance. Um, my name is Diana Wiener, and my co-host this evening is Doreen Werner. I just want to talk a little bit about what we have available for you. First of all, Sullivan Renaissance has a wonderful website that I hope you will visit and navigate. Secondly, we have um, many programs that are still open for um, grants that are available. The first one is a mini grant, with, and these all have rolling deadlines until the funds are exhausted. But the mini uh, grants are up for up to $500 in our beautification program, and it's a great way to get started planting a garden or um, enhancing an existing one. And you can contact Carmela Hugel, member of our staff, for that program. Another grant program that is available still is the program that I run, Business Assistance Grants. And these are grants up to $2,500. Again, rolling deadline, a match is required. And you're going to learn all about that tonight. You're going to learn about curb appeal, and you're going to learn about signage and facade improvements. And we also fund outdoor seating and many other things. So please give me a call, my phone number 295-2612 or mainline or email me, my name, Diana, at sullivanrenaissance.org. We have ca uh, capital improvement grants that are on a rolling deadline for up to $1,500. And these are reimbursable for um, irrigation systems and uh, any type of services that are going to make uh, your uh, um, your, your maintenance easier for your garden. In our community development plant grant program, we have technical assistance grants, and this is for funding for professional services, such as our speaker tonight, <laughs> and um, other architects, landscape architects, engineers, design professionals. Um, we have neighborhood revitalization grants, rolling deadline, up to $2,500 a match is required. And these, this could be for revitalization and engagement in neighborhoods like cleanup projects, pocket parks, street art, and cultural celebrations. We have healthy community initiatives. Some are program-based up to $500 for events, runs, bike rides, uh, yoga, litter, things like that, and healthy community grants that are project-based up to $2,500 for walking, bicycling, uh, bicycling, and hiking trails, park improvements, creation and care of community and edible gardens, tree planting initiatives, and education about environmental and conservation issues of local interest. We have a Catskill Edible Garden Project that I hope you will read more about. And I hope that you will stay tuned with Sullivan Renaissance through our season because we'll be doing exciting clean sweeps that we started during our pandemic, COVID-19 last year. And we'll be um, sprucing up areas around the county. And um, we will we'll be going at one location at a time and we're going to volunteer and uh, uh, we're going to welcome volunteers at these events. And of course, um, we will have social distancing and everything that we need to do so that you feel comfortable. I hope if you want to volunteer, you will um, uh, contact us and at the end we'll have a slide about our next program coming up and that's all about volunteering. And um, I do want to uh, mention members of the staff that are here with us tonight. We do have uh, Carmela Hugel, and I mentioned her name before with our beautification program, my cohort in crime, only kidding. Um, we have our director, Denise Rangipani, uh, Colleen Emery, Corey Dame, who is our chat room queen this evening. And um, of course, Christy Turbush, who we couldn't do without, who is behind the scenes making this magic happen. I now want to turn the program over to our speaker, uh, Doreen Werner from W Design. Um, I, I love working with her. She thinks outside the box. She comes up with some great ideas and wait till you see what she has in store for you. <laughs> oh, and, oh, one more, I'm sorry. <laughs> one more pop-up from our chat. Kathleen Capazzoli. it would not happen without our fiscal manager. She's here tonight as well. Sorry, Kathleen. And now Doreen Warner of W Design. Great. Um, and I just want to um, check in to make sure that um, 
we're monitoring the chat room, but we're going to be addressing comments at the end of the presentation. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. So hold those thoughts, write them down. Thanks, Diana. Thank you so Denise much. Frantipani has entered the room. Hello, <laughs> Denise. Our director is here. Hooray. Okay. I think Thanks. we're all here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Diana. And thank You're you, welcome. Sullivan Renaissance, for putting tonight's together. This is fantastic. And I am so thrilled that so many of you are interested in tonight's topic. Um, I am. I am Doreen Blair of W Design. I'm a, it's a small design company in Berryville, New York, with a broad reach throughout the region, extending along the Northeast coast and throughout the US. Um, this evening, we'll be sharing uh, examples of what I hope will inspire you to enhance your own building facade, signage, possible landscaping, and your overall brand. Throughout the presentation, you'll be seeing examples from W Design's work, along with other area uh, designers and sign makers, and there'll be some examples from various signage websites. Um, in case I forget to bring this up at the end, um, I was told recently about an additional grant from the Upper Delaware Scenic Byway. They're two um, offering a signage Let's see, a signage matching fund program up to $500 to applicants whose businesses are along Route 97, the scenic byway, and details can be found on their website. So, uh, curb appeal as a marketing strategy. That's why we're here tonight. How many of you have ever passed by an unknown shop, a restaurant, a place that just catches your eye and you say, I have to stop in there? Well, that reaction is likely based on your need or the appeal of the place. It just inspires you. You want to go in. Uh, your business exterior presents an opportunity for you to celebrate your business and show your offerings and, how, and your services. Through a well-appointed facade, complimentary um, landscaping, and a legible, well-maintained sign, your facade says, I'm in business, I'm here to serve you. So these elements can give an impression that what your service is going to be like for the user's experience. Let's dive in. So looking at the big picture before you create a sign or have one made, make sure you're thinking about your entire brand, its image and its messaging. Signage is just one element of your brand expansion, ex extension. Make an impression by maintaining a strong, cohesive look across all aspects of your brand's identity. I'm gonna show you some examples of a few projects that Sullivan Renaissance had invited me to participate in. This is a, a building within um, Sullivan County and the client was interested in how to adapt um, or transform their facade and bringing in signage, but also looking at the building itself. Um, there were some interesting uh, points to this facade. So you have two buildings that are actually merged into one. So we decided maybe we should look at the top portion of the building and unify the color. So by taking, and I'm gonna flash back, the design elements and in, in color from the left hand side of building and applying it to the right, it unifies the top part of the building. We added on window boxes and some dimensional lettering for the fascia of the building on the right, in addition to a hanging sign. So when I'm looking at um, opportunities like this, um, sometimes I'll take another look and in this case, we considered toning down the top part of the building and sort of marrying it a little bit with the brick facade. Um, the client wasn't interested in painting the brick, so we thought, well, maybe there's a way to kind of merge them and make them look more cohesive. So this was another opportunity to look at. I would suggest if you're thinking about changing the coloring of your building or adding some signage or altering something in maybe a larger way, to take a snapshot of your current building 
and draw on top of it or ask someone that knows how to use Photoshop to apply some colors. It's an easy, simple, and less expensive way to make a mistake. <laughs> you just change the color and swap things out, um, add a few elements here and there, and it, it makes it a quicker and, as I said, less expensive in, um, in envisioning what you might have. Here's another example. This was a, it's a property in Liberty. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the original facade. And again, Sullivan Renaissance asked me to conduct some visualizations with them. And I proposed the um, example on the right where we replaced the vinyl banner with a shaped sign, uh, removed the window signage that was um, on the right-hand side and took any of the signages that were important to the business and adapted them. So in this case, they also do a currency exchange. So we added additional signage above uh, the door. In addition, uh, we recommended uh, painting the vinyl facade of the apartments above, toning it down and kind of making it live within the brick environment. And then on the, the facade of the business area, we added um, some barn or reclaimed materials, the wood, to just give it another feel, something warm and inviting. In addition, we added um, gooseneck lighting to the fascia and also above the, the seating area where we tiled, again, this is all fictitious, it's in Photoshop, we added tile to the, the seating area to give it more definition and surrounded it by plants to give it more of an authentic feel or an experience uh, for the dining um, authentic Mexican food. Here's another example in Liberty. Um, we, McCabe's was the client. That, um, we, we often tell people to look for inspiration among their neighborhood or their community vernacular. So if you're having a little trouble discerning what it is that your building might need to help uh, spruce it up. In this case, we looked next door, um, a newly painted facade, and it emphasized that McCabe um, might want to do something as well. Um, they asked us to change a couple of elements in our visualization. That was paint, how the signage treatment is handled, um, in this case, they're using an existing shape and place their letters on it. And then there's photographs of the types of food or what's offered inside. So this is what we offered them. It's a different, I'm gonna flash back because it's so cool to see this happen. <laughs> um, so here we have kind of a, a more like New England or uh, early American style uh, window treatment. So it's a multi-pane window. Um, we changed that on the top and the bottom and added window, uh, window boxes. There's additionally, we've just took the, the, work, the type as it existed from a caves, pulled it out of that sign shape and put it right directly onto the fascia of the, the building. And instead of having photographs of food that they may have or not, we just simplified it to food, drink and music. Um, so here we have a color scheme that's complementary to the business next door. And then we offered a toned down version um, as, a, as, a, as an alternative. In addition, we thought we would look at the opposite side of the color wheel and see what it would be like to use a, an Irish uh, flag theme. So green, orange, and white. And then removed the green and showed a version of just using orange and sort of a burgundy color. Um, and in this case, we removed the window boxes and put in planters. So e any of these could be changed out um, seasonally, and I can let Diana step in. On right. So uh, planters, planters like this, there are so many new um, additions to the market that really make your life easy. There's earth planters and urban scape planters that um, hold um, up to three gallons of water and don't have to be watered for two to three weeks. 
And so this is amazing that you don't have to worry about the plants that are out there, except for maybe a leaf or a, a stem that may just have to be um, cut off. You don't have to worry about watering every day out there. So we do have resources like that on our website. And I hope that you will uh, check that out and find out more about these water labor saver type of baskets. One more thing, or two more elements I wanted to point out in these mock-ups is that we also um, included uh, gooseneck lighting above the apartment door access, as well as above the sign, the hanging perpendicular sign. I'm just gonna flash back real quick. Uh, we did the same on the, the previous one. It's just they kind of blend in a little bit more being dark and they were a little bit more prominent against the, uh, the orange field. Okay. So here's another example. It's a, a additionally a Liberty uh, business. International Delhi Grocery is using dimensional letters on the face of their, their um, face of their facade. And we've mocked up uh, a version of unifying all of those letters into one horizontal sign at the top. Um, an additional perpendicular signage that would go underneath the awning for those that are walking by you know, pedestrian traffic. Um, painted the, the trim uh, in between the windows and the walls themselves. Again, giving it a cohesive look. We, you know, we picked a color theme that wasn't too much distant from what they had originally. We just kind of brought it into um, a, a complete look. And then that snappy awning just makes it great. It, it's color, it's fun. It's got um, you know personality and it also it offers shelter. So, and I think with this one, if you wanted to put any plants in front, I would probably put a rectangular planter right near the woman and her dog in that section there, so that you could still see in the windows. Hmm. I should add that to the mock-up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Okay, so what we're talking about here is brand identity and brand identity is your overall look of your communications. It helps tell your business's story. Um, elements of creating brand identity are fonts, colors, and different graphic elements to create that cohesive look of distinction. Um, people typically know brand identity as a logo. This would then apply to your signage, both interior, exterior on the property as well as your vehicle. I mean, you're driving around town and you know, everything should be um, consistent in their look and treatment. And then you have your advertising and marketing, which would cover print and online, social media websites, uh, radio messaging, uh, apparel and packaging. So again, you're creating this family of representation of what your business is. You're telling a story about who you are, where you go or where he, people see or hear from you. So here's an example of a, an awesome logo. Um, it's just, it's fun, there's movement and their brand color is this brilliant um, red. And your logo can be interpreted into various types of signage and beyond. So in this case, this logo in the upper right hand corner easily made itself into uh, a signage for the exterior, signage that is hanging down, and that could be interior and it could be exterior on the corner of the building. Um, it also can be applied to your windows. So there is another brand extension, uh, another way of communicating the apparel and various uh, types of advertising. So how do you know if you need a new sign? Uh, there's questions to ask yourself. Is your sign legi legible from a distance? Um, so take into consideration the placement of the sign. So where is it hung uh, in the ground? Is it on, mounted onto a wall? And what is the pace of the reader? Are they driving or are they walking? Well, that really depends on where your business is located and where the traffic is coming from. And then the condition of your sign. Um, a poor sign reflects on your customer service. Uh, it can reflect on the cleanliness of the business or how well it's maintained and whether you're still in business. Um, there might be a time where you've gone past a sign and it doesn't look like it, the business is operating. And it's just a matter of it needs to just have a refresh. So how do you determine that? 
So when we look at developing signs, we have a series of principles that we sort of check off to see if we're covering. Um, we're gonna go through the first four. I'll show you some examples. And then we're gonna go through another set of principles. So the first one is just to identify your audience, what type of customer you wanna attract, you know, who, who's coming to your business. Um, that might be wide, it could be narrow. And your, your facade, your signage, the way you present yourself should be attracting that customer. Your message, it should be clear and simple. You wanna take the guesswork out of it, especially if you're in a location where the traffic is moving quickly. Um, there's only so much time and that they can read your sign and they may have to pass a couple of times even for that. Um, the placement, so can, as we said, consider the speed of the traffic um, and if there's background noise. Now by that I mean if you have a sign and then behind the sign um, are trees and greenery, then your sign is likely to pop against that background. If the background is a parking lot full of cars or another building with their signage or some other multiple layered of busyness, that's called background noise. Your sign has to compete with whatever's behind it. So take that into consideration when you're thinking of color. Um, color should be extended from your brand, so your logo but there may be some adjustments that you need to make based on all the things we've just mentioned. So the location, the visibility, what the background is happening. So let's look at color first. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because this is a huge topic, um, but color is, can be broken down fairly simply and you probably will all be familiar with this from early days. Um, so primary colors, which are red, yellow, and blue, they're basic, they're bright colors. Um, as you saw with the Better Burger, that was like bright red and it still works really well. Some businesses will go for the secondary colors, which are um, green or orange and purple. Those colors are made from those primary colors. When you mix two primaries, you get a secondary color. Those colors are a little bit more muted and they are they could be called sophisticated, but again, I bring you back to the Better Burger, that is quite a statement too. And then you have tertiary, um, which would be the dotted line that you're seeing. Um, I'm sorry, you're not seeing the dotted line. There's no line. It's yellow, green, yellow, orange, red, orange. Basically, you're taking the adjacent colors on the color uh, of primary colors and mixing them together to create an in-between. So red and purple is a reddish purple color. Why is this important? Well, when you're picking colors for your sign, you want to make sure that you're choosing colors that work well together. And how do you determine that? Well, you look at the value and the contrast of the colors that you're putting together. So on the left-hand side, um, these, are letter, these are colors that are not, they're more of a, 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 a toned down primary color or a secondary color. Um, if you look closely at it, you can start to see the value. The top and the bottom, meaning the red and the tealy blue colors are deeper. They're a darker color than say the yellow in the middle. So you wanna be careful when you're um, using lighter colors, especially at a distance, they may be hard to read if you're using like white or light type. I often recommend people to use a squint test which means you just squint your eyes and if the text starts to disappear or any valued elements, meaning anything that's important that you want it to pop out, if that is disappearing, then you need to adjust your colors. So again, back to that idea of your brand color, it may need to be adjusted a little bit depending upon how you're using it. On the right, we're just showing you extreme cases of um, background colors and text colors and how they would work together. Again, you can use that squint test to decide, is, is this going to be legible? So this middle box is hardly legible at all. There's barely a contrast between the, the foreground text and the background. So you would want to avoid a color combination like that. The other thing you want to keep in mind is there is population that has a color vision deficiency. So they have trouble distinguishing colors. Um, a common one would be 
uh, a colorblindness between red and green. I'm having a hard time discerning that. I'm gonna break this um, screen share for a moment by showing you a test that we use. So this is a, an app that I have. Um, right now you're seeing uh, the screen as you have been viewing it, but I can simulate what it would be if you were lacking the ability to discern between green and yellow. So everything takes on a sort of muted yellow brown tone. And if you had trouble distinguishing yellows and blues, you end up seeing the opposite side of that color wheel I was showing you. It's, it translates to more reds and teals and, and greens. Um, another way to, to perform that squint test is just by making everything grayscale. So removing the hue of the color and allowing you just to see the contrast. Now I know that I'm throwing a lot of at you and it's a little probably overwhelming. I would just recommend, um, you know, again, performing those squint tests, talking to um, a designer or a sign maker that is um, used to working with colors. They'll very quickly be able to sort of lead you in one direction or the other to just tweak those, those elements. Okay, so here's an opportunity to take advantage when maintenance is needed. The sign on the top, the letters are falling off. Um, it's time to address whether we should just paint or redesign. And in this case, the owners decided to continue the blue background to the top of the building and change the emphasis of the yellow and the blue. And they also added more contrast to the tagline building on trust. I'm gonna show you some more before and afters because those are always great to see. This is a super one, um, Gulliver's Quality Books and Toys. So the left, there needs to be a, a, a review of the signage and the overall building treatment. On the right, they did a fantastic job of adjusting the architectural value by adding corbels and a cornice and other kinds of features to create some interest to, you know, to have that aha moment, somebody walks by, I didn't know there was a bookstore there. Another thing they've done is they pulled out the tagline, quality books and toys, making much more emphasis on it. So often um, names of stores don't necessarily represent what it is the business does. So if you just said I was going to Gulliver's, I don't know what Gulliver's offers. They offer quality books and toys. So sometimes it's really important to make sure you have a tagline or some kind of suggestion of what is happening within the, the store. Doreen, they also have, I don't know what you would call them, the kickboards on the bottom. So they've... Oh yes, look at that. They've yeah. added that in. I think all around these little touches, they really just bring a wow factor. Um, and again, here are those uh, famous uh, gooseneck lighting. And previously they didn't have any lighting at all. So I think this is just a really great before and after. And of course they can have window boxes and planters and things. <laughs> Absolutely. Street trees if they Bring could. Bring those flowers in. <laughs> so here's the before and after, um, power washing the building and giving it a nice paint job around the window trim and on the, the door here. It also provides an opportunity to kind of look at the signage in general. So, I'm very pleased that they, they put together um, just a very clean red sign, um, clean type, but they also took it as an opportunity to address the additional vendor signs or partnerships that they work with. You know, if you have a business that, um, let's say you have, a, it's a convenience store where they have a new beer coming out every uh, six months or so, maybe in six months, you look back at your windows and say, I can take these old signs out. I'm not promoting these anymore, as opposed to just keep on kind of littering signs all over the building. You can see besides the, the need to just power wash, looking at the after with less is more attitude um, helps, it helps the overall appearance and I think the, present, the presenting allows you to understand what the business does. Um, here's a before and after. Again, think out the box. If, you're, if your building maybe doesn't have 
um, architectural accents. Um, think about what it might have or look around the neighborhood and see, is there something that I could be adding to this building to give it a little more impact or pizzazz? Um, does your, your current sign communicate what you offer? Do you need to refine your message? Um, so this presentation was brought to you by Keller Signs. Um, on the left is the original, um, just Monticello Green Market with their uh, telephone number. In the middle, that was a concept that was presented. Um, they wanted to integrate um, some visuals, uh, some representation of what they offer. Um, they changed the shape of the sign to allow it to have more space to do so. Um, but in the end, they felt that they wanted to emphasize the, this fresh sushi. And there really isn't a need to have the telephone number on the sign because these days you can just, if you have a phone, you can type in Monticello Green Market and it's gonna give you the location, the telephone, and if they have a website, et cetera. So the far right is what they um, decided on. And they have a really nice post in that one too. You know, yeah. they redid the post. Yeah, and there's some, and, and some nice depth to the sign as well. So yeah. that's something to always consider is like boxing out, giving your sign a little bit of um, depth will add some impact. So here's a, an opportunity to look at whether your logo needs some redesigning. Um, on the left is Le Nelly's Latin restaurant before. On the right, we just pulled out Nelly's, gave it a little bit more personality as if Nelly had written her name. And the elements of the fork, knife, and plate you will see in the next round. So on the left-hand side is the exterior of the building before and the sign that they have, which the logo is barely legible, if at all. And that's just because of the color we were talking about. You know, it's not popping, you can't read it. Um, the format isn't so great. Um, so we reimagined the whole exterior. Um, she wanted to stick with the red, white, and blue color theme. Um, the elements of what it is that she offered, she was, um, excited about maintaining. And at this particular location, her goal was to have to utilize the three entrance ways to the building. The first doorway was for takeout and it was identified with a takeout bag. The middle um, entrance way was for the restaurant. And then the far um, entrance way is for the lounge. So icons on each of the doors, as well as um, text on the window itself, instructing people which, uh, which door to go into. Um, we also utilized a, um, a design of uh, like a metal, metal architectural design that she wanted to place into columns um, as well. And then overall, we kept that plate design by making uh, circles. Uh, and this is the executed uh, restaurant. So you can see that we have the application of the architectural elements. Um, takeout restaurant is on that window sign. There is a perpendicular hanging sign for those that are pedestrians walking um, the block. So if they're at the end of the block, they'll be able to see Nellie's restaurant there. There's an alleyway too. So as they're coming around, they'll know that Nellie's is right there. And those for driving by or from across the street will be able to see Nellie's on the facade itself. Diana, do you wanna talk about this one? I do, it's one of my favorites. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you could talk about the sign, um, but uh, yeah, and it's uh, the old sign definitely needed um, to be replaced. And uh, the big rock wasn't going anywhere, folks. But they did put, I love to call these bondage boxes because the plants are in bondage once they're in there. And, you know, sometimes these just don't have a place in the landscape, but in this particular case, it really was needed because they did want to have some uh, fresh greenery underneath their new sign. So the, the sign itself is um, very attractive looking. And instead of it saying private, 
no trespassing. I call it my no-no signs. <laughs> Instead, it says community members only. I think it's a softer way of saying who's allowed to come in and who isn't. Yeah. Um, so a very sophisticated sign. Of course, it's in Swan Lake, so you can see the swans nestled in the greenery down below. They have a nice mix of annuals that will uh, um, will bloom through the season, uh, petunias and scavola. And um, on the right-hand side of this uh, um, bondage box, there is a deep culvert. So we really needed this box to maintain some, some kind of greenery there. And of course the neighbors um, had a beautiful Rose of Sharon, um, which uh, blooms for a long time through August. Um, if you do wanna use Rose of Sharon, I suggest you use the sterile varieties because they get, can get a little wild if you use the straight species. Yes, I, I love um, the fact that this community took advantage of um, not just adding such wonderful landscaping, and, but also the messaging is clearly needed to be addressed for those that were living there, visiting there, or perhaps buying a home there. It felt very, um, uh, just, just a little bit on the negative side. And now it, it has a more welcoming appearance, but also just telling you, you have to be a member to come in. So uh, I think they achieved a lot in this um, upgrade. And that was um, the sign is from uh, Fine Hand Signs. I do a lot of work with Nicole Camacho of Fine Hand Signs. She's a wonderful uh, fabricator. Um, speaking of which, Nicole worked on this project with me. Um, this is just a, a question. Does your town welcome sign need to be more effective? So here we have welcome to the town of Thompson on the left and the town uh, approached me to ask, you know, how we might utilize the existing stone pillars and replace the, um, the town of Thompson sign, which is just the contrast really wasn't there. It was hard to read and the sign itself is a distance from the, the, the street um, based on the setbacks. Um, it's also in front of a mobile station, a gas station. So that creates that kind of chaos I was telling you about. Like, don't, you know, it's not just about what's in front of the sign, it's also what is behind it. So um, I th thought it through and I thought, well, you know what, let's make the suggestion. Let's pull that sign out from between the pillars, put it on top and enlarge it. That will resolve a couple of questions, a couple of things. One, we're making it larger, which is great. But two, um, there's more prominence. We're kind of blocking a little bit more of that gas station. I mean, you still know it's a gas station, believe me. If I zoomed out, you could see gas station all over it. But here we're creating this environment. So we have um, Town of Thompson. We're still utilizing that center part to sort of um, block out the passer buyers and the, and the people filling up at the pump. Um, and then there's all these this gorgeous landscaping in front of it that drives your eye right towards the sign. Diane, did you want to comment a little bit about the... the, the yeah, well, it, it's, it, it's always a good idea to do um, some uh, core tests and what I call dig holes and dig tests to uh, find out what is going on underneath here because we found that there was a very wet area for I don't know if it's a leaky pipe we've never actually gotten to the bottom of it um, but now we had to rethink uh, where we planted uh, plants and how we were going to do it and actually I met with um, uh, the town of Thompson in the fall for a, a municipal uh, checkup which we do and we talk about maintenance and what they're going to do I think is a smart idea and that is to look at all of their welcome signs and their entrances and exits to the town of Thompson and have that plant material all jive and be the same. So you know that when you come, you're going to see the same uh, shrubs and the flowers and the same uh, colors of annuals and then long blooming perennials. So take a look at exit 105B next summer and um, so and then start looking around the town of Thompson and I see I think you'll see what we're trying to say there about cohesiveness when you're a municipality. Mm. Uh, Diana, thanks for mentioning the other signs. So 
Um, this is a close up of the mobile sign on the left. So you can see the dimensions that we've added. There's a layer to the type. Um, the white uh, backboard is a relief to a, um, a box. Now it's a double sided sign. So what you see on the front is also on the mobile um, side of this, this sign, the mobile station sign. And then on the right hand side, you'll see um, the additional gateways to the, the other um, town entrances. So they have a comparable sign. It's not as elaborate as what you're seeing on the left at the mobile station, but it still has depth and it's very attractive and remains cohesive with the overall brand. So um, the, on the right, that's what uh, Diana was talking about. Beneath these signs is where you would be having these additional um, plantings, correct? Yes. Yeah. And also the uh, Sullivan Catskill signs on uh, 105B and they'll be doing 105A, so going east or west. Excellent. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so could your, wel your welcome sign or your gateway sign to your hamlet be more representative of its identity? So in the case um, on the left-hand side, that sign I believe was from maybe the 60s or so. At one point it was red, then it was painted white. Um, but through a county grant and then also Sullivan Renaissance grant to do the gardening, they took advantage of this triangle, a traffic triangle, to create a really nice experience. Um, they, the sign itself is representat representative of the river corridor. So Berryville sits right on the river. You can see it when you come into town, uh, the hamlet. Um, and then we also have our resident eagles. So people do come here to sit by the river and watch the eagles and photograph them. So that made it into the sign as well. Here's an example of where your posts can be an extension of the sign. So just because you have posts, they don't have to remain one color or no color. You can integrate the design into it as well. It adds some texture during the months when maybe the foliage isn't as green or bright. Um, you still have some nice color influences. Um, oh, Diana caught this before. So if you're paying attention, the esti estimated dates of 18 uh, or established dates of 1830 changed to 8 1831 because we wanted to verify that that was the correct date before we put it on the new sign. It turns out it wasn't right. And the, the local, um, the town historian did research for us just to make sure um, that we were putting the right uh, date on there. <laughs> um, so here's another example of a municipality. This is uh, Rosendale up uh, the Hudson River area. Um, this sign incorporates architectural details that are found throughout the town. It's a very historic town. Um, rail, there's a railroad trestle that um, spans over the town itself and the, the, the river that goes through it. Um, and it connects the rail trail system, which really helps drive um, uh, not just residents, you know, to that area and to come into town on the weekends, but also a lot of outsiders. So it was really important for them to give a, a refresh and a rebrand to their town. Um, so we went and visited and uh, again, we picked up on some architectural elements. The other element that's really strong in the area um, is their, their historic brick cement kilns where they um, created natural cement, which actually cemented a lot of the bases for um, landmarks down in New York City, including um, Liberty Island. Very exciting. So um, besides just the gateway sign, we actually created um, and have now installed uh, parking signage, directional. Um, this is an example of banners that can be switched out. They all have that cohesive look. So the curve to the bottom, the trestle at the top, and then we have wayside um, or interpretive signs as well. So again, when you're looking at your, sun, your gateway for your town or your hamlet, you know, it's not just one sign. It's not isolated amongst that one, we got to, you know, dig a hole and put this in and replace it. Um, really think big picture. Think, what am I doing? Is this the brand of the town? If I'm going to start something, what all do I want it to encompass? So don't always think of myopically at just one job. 
you don't have, you can plan for the future. You don't have to do it right away, but just keep it all in mind. Here's an example. We worked with the town of Liberty and we started with their um, gateway sign. So the first, the, the left and the center is the gateway sign. Um, you see it during the day and at night, we took advantage of making those letters reflective um, so that if there was not a light source, those that were driving past could still see the sign sort of light up and welcome them. Um, we then segued into doing directional signage for them, which type also is um, reflective. So it can be seen at night um, as you're coming off of uh, 17 or just through the town. And then through an extended grant, we then applied that same look to their parks. So you can see the before and afters. Be, be, on the bottom is the before signs and above are the afters. So this is, these are all carved signs. Um, it was really exciting to work with them and see how they're transforming forming the look of their, their town. Okay, so we ta kind of tackled the first four principles. Um, I'm going to jump in the latter four, but before I do that, Diana, I just want to ask you, I have not been paying attention to the time. How are we? Uh, 6.48. Is that we're good on time? I can keep going? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the next principles are going to be materials and texture. So I'm going to talk out some of the things that you've just seen, uh, displays, so how those signs are mounted. Um, the style, we've talked a little bit about that, but we're going to focus on it a little bit more. And then lighting. Okay, so materials. Um, wood is, you know, the first thing that people usually think of when they say, I want a carved sign. I want a wood sign. They're beautiful. They're fantastic. They're expensive. Um, and that's because you have to work with a hardwood. You can't do it out of pine. It's going to, it's not going to carve nicely. You're not going to get a crisp line. Um, and it's not going to last too long. Um, so the time that if you were going to do a carved, carved wood sign, um, you just have to think of expense and also the time it takes to actually do that. Um, so keep that in your, in your mind when you say, I need a sign, I need it now, it's not gonna be a carved wood sign. Um, the alternative to carved wood is a high density polyurethane or commonly just referred to as HDU. Um, it is a synthetic uh, material um, it's not exactly like a foam insulation, but it's, if you needed something to visualize, it's kind of like that. It comes in square sheets, various thicknesses, and you can sandblast or carve out from it. Um, it holds up well to all kinds of weather conditions, and it needs to be painted because otherwise it stays this really just horrible green color. And so it's not an alternative to wood if you want um, to just stain a wood and see that grain, or you want to just add a polyurethane finish so you can see the wood, wood grain. High density um, poly polyurethane needs to be painted, needs to be sealed and covered, but it will stay up. Um, the examples for Liberty, those were HDU signs. Um, and then there's a PVC plastic. It's strong, it's lightweight. Um, the thinner you get with it, you have to make sure that you have a hard backing, otherwise it will move. Um, but a thicker PVC, like the Nellie's round sign that was uh, perpendicular to the building, that was a half inch PVC. Um, so knowing your materials, you don't have to come to a designer or a sign maker and say, I want X, Y, Z. Just describe what it is that you're thinking and then they'll be able to tell you these are some example materials and talk you through the process. So uh, Doreen, uh -huh. with the, with the uh, materials themselves, is there a, a specific one that you think lasts the longest? Hmm. It really, it depends on um, conditions. So where your sign is, um, if you're in a damp, uh, area, a um, lot of tree overgrowth, um, a wood sign, you'd really have to be careful about that because you might be creating some moss. You'd want to make sure that it was really sealed well so it wouldn't start to crack or warp. 
Um, but also if it was out in the elements um, and it's very windy, you know, you want to make sure that you're securing it right. So it, it is really about having a conversation with whoever you're working with. If it's directly with the sign maker, um, informing them of if they don't come on site, inform them of where your sign is going to go and they'll help you make those decisions. Great. The, the HDU is a good alternative, but it's not earthy friendly. Thank you. Um, then you could use a, like a flat substrate um, and apply dimensional letters, which could be made of plastic or metal cast or um, various types of acrylic. And those can either be custom or sign makers usually have uh, vendors that have a list of fonts. So basically you have your Garamon and your Arial and your Helvetica. So standard fonts, or you can make them custom. So whenever you hear the, the hear the word custom, it's going to cost a little bit more, but you're going to have that uniqueness. Um, paints and enamels can be applied to different types of surfaces from wood to plastic or PVC. Um, they have a really durable lifespan. A lot of the times just MDO with beautiful paint um, on it can make a beautiful sign that can last forever. You don't necessarily need to have dimensions and um, carvings, you know, it, again, it's what's appropriate for your business and really sends the message of what your brand represents. Um, and then there's vinyl. Vinyl um, can be applied to, in this case, this is an example on glass. Um, it can be also, as I said, on painted wood. Sometimes sign makers will have painted wood and then they apply um, vinyl letters or lines striping to it. And they may also combine that with hand paint. So um, your sign may have various um, different applications um, to it. And then there's digital prints, which is on the bottom where we made a shape sign and we created dimensionally um, in a, a flat surface, but it appears dimensional based on how the graphics are. So the lifespan on that can generally be, uh, if, if you'll have to check with your sign maker um, and who, how they um, print the material and what material is on. Uh, when we do digital signs, um, they can last between five to, to eight years, sometimes more, again, depending upon where it is. If it's in the light all the time, you know, it may not last as long. Um, but you can also have a UV overlay to cut down on the, the sun's impact on those um, prints and also just like the elements in general. Doreen, we have five minutes. We want to leave some time oh. for questions. Yikes. OK, I'm going to screen. I'm just going to sure. run through sure. these. <laughs> these are just examples of different kinds of signs. Um, I think that this is going to be available. So um, you can see all the details, but it's just basically painting and carving on this one, metals and various um, combinations of materials. Um, Vinyl is a, is a temporary example. On the right, it's a, a permanent solution. So aluminum with paint or vinyl lettering. Again, just dimensional signs and different materials. Um, utilizing recycled or reclaimed wood and then just burning into it. So again, if it really matches your brand. Uh, other various uses of wood. As you can say, I, I really love wood and working with wood. It's just, it has to be an appropriate spot. And, you know, we've made all this fuss about different kinds of signs, but a, just a simple overall color on, applied onto the building itself and simple letters can be really striking and memorable. I love this example. I think it's just spot on. Um, or taking advantage of an existing uh, broadside and just painting directly on the building creates some kind of some uh, real like texture and uh, your or, favorite. Go ahead. My favorite. <laughs> yeah, your favorite. I know this is so awesome. So signs ever just put some like gold leaf on the window and then make a fantastic memorable like experience with this impactful like large quartz everybody's going to remember that and they're going to go to your wine shop. It's amazing. <laughs> um, so the other thing I want to just um, touch base on is to make sure that before you like plan ahead, before you start designing, 
review your town core code, um, see if you need to have a permit. This is an example of a situation where roof signs are not allowed, but it was grandfathered in, so they took advantage of using it. Um, there, you might be in a position to do that. Um, you just don't wanna go through the expense of creating a sign and then not being able to put it up. Uh, and again, these are just examples of how to create some atmosphere, um, describing your business from the outside so people know what to experience in the inside. They need better landscaping on the left. They do. It was like, I, I wanted to go in and Photoshop it. I'm like, ah. Um, again, just various versions of how your um, signs can take different shapes. And I'm going to just quickly um, go through these signs real quick. Um, this was an inspiration that was taken from a postcard on the left. And then we created um, uh, time appropriate or age appropriate signage and kind of even gave it a little bit of a, an older look for carved signs in the eaves hanging and window signage. And we also brought it into the inside so their beer coolers have that same technique. Again, the signage here, we only had the photograph on the left from the 40s. Um, I blew it up and gave it to the sign maker after I enlarged it and they recreated that same sign for Hotel Faucher. And then this other sign is a shape from the 1940s or 50s. We took the shape, but we changed the text inside. So you can adapt things, you know, look back, look for inspiration in architecture, see if that might influence what you have, or you could just paint the whole thing black and put simple letters up on it. I mean, there are all kinds of options out there. Um, this is just really quick. Um, if you do have any signage directories, um, we have a couple of quick tips. Uh, the left is just kind of sign chaos, as I had mentioned. And if you limit the number of fonts, colors, and size of things, you can create a consistent look, which will allow people to actually see what types of businesses are in the property. Um, lighting, various types of lighting. Um, goosenecks are really uh, popular around here. They come in different shapes, sizes, and angles. Solar power. Um, if you're going to use spotlights, make sure that you check with your town code that a lot of them allow you to project lighting up. And if so, you have to have them hooded, meaning blades are, um, need to be on them to direct the, um, the light. Um, and then this brings us to a client of ours, Caroline Act. She's a new business on 17B. She, they put in this new building, has great architectural detail. We used it as part of our inspiration for the logo. Um, the sign that you see here is just temporary because Caroline is applying or has applied for the Sullivan Renaissance grant. And Diana? Yes, and the reveal. <laughs> <laughs> Getting a grant to make the temporary a permanent sign and put landscaping around the sign. But she's not going to put the landscaping in front of the sign itself. She's going to concentrate just on the left and the right, keeping things low so that we don't lose that architectural element throughout the year. She is going to edge it instead of just a mound of, of mulch by uh, placing um, blue stone halfway into the ground and sticking up on its side. So it, it'll be almost like a, a small wall, thin wall that goes around. And again, won't take away from the beautiful sign and the money that's there. Yes. So I think we did it in enough time. <laughs> We did. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> you, you, I, well, first, let's clap. I open to you, too. <laughs> and, and then I think we have some questions. Okay. So, here we go. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. So, um, Corey, are you there? Sure, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to email or text them to you, so that's what I did. But one question was, um, can the lettering on the HDU be raised? Yes, so HDU um, can be, and I'm just going to see if I can flip back really quick to the Liberty one. Um, is, HDU is like, a, imagine maybe a two inch or an inch thick um, piece of uh, substrate. You can carve into it. And then in this case, if you look kind of closely to where the raised part is, 
the letters are carved in and then they're the same uh, level as the trim. But then we also did some appliques. So we added to the sign to add it more dimension um, from the side. So it's beyond the straight surface. You start building on top. So you can carve in and you can build out. Um, I personally had a question. Um, do you have to consider any kind of ADA or um, second or English as a second language um, barriers when, when designing in certain neighborhoods? Interesting. Um, you know, we, we haven't done that um, on business signage, but I've done a number of projects that are trail related. And in that case, we end up using symbols and English. Um, and there's an instance where we may be using um, Spanish and I'm hoping that one of my projects may actually incorporate Braille. So oh, very cool. Let's see. <laughs> They're beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, I didn't have any other ones that came through. Um, we do have a few more slides. Okay. Let me go back there really quick. Get to see it all over again. I love I it. There we lots go. of compliments. <laughs> so um, I hope that you will join us for our April seminar, uh, Finding Great Volunteers. They are out there on Wednesday, April 7th um, from at 6 p.m. right here on their Zoom channel. And uh, please uh, sign up. You can do that through uh, Facebook from our website. We make it easy for you. And I do want you to um, please go to our website and look at the resources that we have available to you. That's where you could find the grant applications, their form fillable PDH, PDFs. And um, I, I just want to um, take a moment this evening before we close to recognize uh, the staff um, that are here this evening. So uh, we do have, first of all, I wanna thank um, our founder, um, Sandra Gary, for um, all that happens with uh, Sullivan Renaissance. And then Denise Frangipani, our executive director is here tonight. Kathleen Capizzoli, who is our fiscal manager. Um, Allison Capella, our community development program manager. Corey Dame, who just spoke and um, is our marketing and communications uh, manager. Colleen Emery, who is our healthy communities initiative program manager. Carmela Hugel, our beautification program manager. And Louise Scandariato, who will be um, hosting our April seminar and uh, Christy Turbish, who is our program coordinator, and we could not do this without her, and uh, me, Diana Weiner, the Horticulture Program Manager. So Doreen, I wanna thank you again for such an informative, visual, and incredible um, presentation this evening. Um, one more chance for any questions. It looks like there was one that I misinterpreted and I thought was answered, but what type of sign do you prefer? I, I'm guessing that's um, meaning like parallel to a road or perpendicular. Oh. That, I, I guess I interpret it being like weather resistant, but I think it's more okay. the structure of the sign or, or build out. Sure. Well, I mean, it, it, um, the orientation of the sign really depends on the application. Um, so you know, again, identifying where you are, if you are in a business district where there's walking traffic, then having um, a perpendicular sign to the building is apropos, but you'll also need a broad sign on the facade. Um, so again, you'll need to go back to your town code to see what the um, rules are for the amount of square footage of a particular business or the amount of signage you're allowed. Um, and so then you would have to, if, if you're only allowed so much, you'd have to weigh the orientation. If you're on, um, say, a large, um, like 17B or 55 or 97, then a, um, a sign that's perpendicular to the building so that passer buyers that are driving can see it. So again, it's really orientation depends on who's seeing your, your sign. Great. Thank you, Doreen. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that wraps it up. 
I hope you'll check in and listen to uh, Leah Worrell in April. I hope you go to our website. I hope that you will um, decide that you do want to do something, either volunteer or to have a project with Sullivan Renaissance. We're available for site visits and we're here to help you. Have a wonderful evening and Doreen, thanks again. Thank you. Have a nice night. Good night all.